So good evening and welcome to the October 19th, uh, 2021 Community Board One meeting. We have on hand Mr. Alexander Kipp, Director of Education and Engagement from the New York City Conflict of Interest Board, who will do community board training session for conflicts of interest. Mr. Kipp, take it away. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hey, everybody, nice to be with you virtually. Uh, I'm gonna get right into sharing some slides. Um, let's see here, I'm having a little trouble sharing my slides. It says, host disabled participant uh, slide sharing. Yep. Is there somebody who can Come help on. me with that? Yeah, I can do that right now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I always find with these virtual things, a little slideshow kind of anchors us a little bit better. That's why I like to do it. You know, normally I don't do that in our meetups. And I'm going to miss you at the Astoria World, um, whatever, the wedding hall that we usually have these meetings at. Sorry, I can't be with you this time. Um, Olivia, should I try again? Yes, it says all panelists. Uh, Got it. We are, we are good. Thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. Okay, friends, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to do this deck here. Uh, the, uh, um, once, uh, what's that? One, two, percent. Um, and for uh, those of you who've seen my spiel before, this is going to be the same kind of information. I'm going to move fast because there's a lot to cover. And I know that this is a big meeting and you've got a lot of people from elected officials office who's got to speak out really important stuff. So I'm going to jump right into it. If you have questions, the way we're going to do it tonight is you're, I'm going to ask you to put them in the chat. And then when I'm done with my presentation, I'm going to jump off talking. Somebody else is going to talk and I'm going to answer your questions as I can in the chat. So I'll still be on the call uh, invisibly just answering the questions in the chat. Um, let me get into the slides right now, though. OK, friends, as you probably know, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you now, we've got a New York City conflicts of interest law. It is Chapter 68 of the city charter. Most of it concerns itself with the conflicts between public interest and private duties of regular old city employees like myself who get a salary from the city and work for the city 40, 50, 60 hours a week. But there is a special section that covers the activities of community board members specifically when, it, when, when we're talking about voting, especially. Now, there are a couple of other things in the conflict of interest law that cover everybody, whether you're a full-timer like me or you're a community board member, we'll review those at the end, but the majority of our time today is gonna to be spent on conflicts of interest law and voting. And before I do that, I'll just do like one or two kind of general things. Um, the first general thing is just, this is what the law is all about on this slide right here. The law's intention, and this is taken right from our preamble uh, that they, you know, Charter Revision Commission wrote 30 years ago, is the law's intention is to preserve and promote public integrity by helping public servants address conflicts between public duties and private interests before those conflicts become ethics violations. Now, woven into that, of course, is the idea that all of us have private interests, particularly community board members who have chosen to volunteer their time to be these special kind of public servants. You were chosen because of your interest in the community, the places you work, the kinds of businesses you run, the not-for-profits you're involved with, and the other wonderful things you do in your community. So you're going to have private interests, and any public serving have a private interest is not an ethical failing. We should remember that. Conflicts of interest mostly happen to great people doing great things. You've got private interests. I've got private interests. Here are some of the private interests that I've had over the last 18 months, binge watching The Man in the High Castle, binge watching the first 30 minutes of Elaine Mace Ishtar, which is quite simply the best, binge watching the last 30 minutes of Star Wars Rogue One, which is also the best in that franchise. You know why? Because all the characters die at the end, waiting for deliveries, waiting, reading articles about home workouts, making a plan to start a home workout, generally about why I can't start my home workout. What is wrong with me? And you know what? The law can't help me with any of those things, but what it can help me with is stuff on this list. And, and this is what is really important when we think about conflicts for community board members is it's mostly these financial conflicts that are on this list. Um, conflicts where my own private interests of, of my business that I own or work at are implicated or my own property or the financial, <coughs> excuse me, the financial interest of a party which is associated with me, like a business partner, a client, an employer, my supervisor at my private employer. Um, if my employer is a not-for-profit, then any 
body that funds my not-for-profits operating budget of over 10% I'm also so associated with. Um, if I sit on the board of a not-for-profit, which usually you do not for pay, um, you're still associated with that not-for-profit because you have obligations to that not-for-profit under state law duty of loyalty, duty of care, duty of uh, something else I can't remember. Um, and then, you know, also uh, associated parties like your roommates, uh, your landlord, your creditor, your debtor, or your close relatives, your spouses, your kids, your siblings. Okay, this is uh, a financial interest of you or these associated parts. That's what the conflicts are really about. Now, there's another big kind of conflict that's not about financial. I'll get to that in a second, but let's dwell on some of this stuff first. Um, just before we get into um, um, everything that the law says, I just want to say a shout out to my agency about how you can use us. Basically, we've got three units that you need to know about. We've got a training unit. I run that unit when I'm not delivering fascinating webinars such as this. I run a team that makes fascinating content such as this nightmarish video, which actually went viral. Um, if you're on social media, my advice to you would be to stop it. Get off of it. Doesn't I mean, makes people dumb and violent. Think that's what it's good for. We've seen that. But if you can't get yourself off of social media, you should follow us because while we are dumb, we're not violent and we'll always teach you something about ethics while making you laugh. All right. Enough about me. Um, more importantly, one on one that we are charged with and must give you when you ask for it, confidential free legal advice. We were set up 30 years ago. The law says we got to do that. It's the most important thing that we do. So you call us or you email us through our website. We give you one-on-one -on -one confidential advice for free. Now, remember this, folks, is that in life, not just in conflicts of interest, but when should you ask for advice? <gasps> Before you do the thing, not after you do the thing, because asking after you've done a bad thing, that's not advice, that's a confession. So call us before, we'll give you the advice. Um, uh, most of the things community board members are doing, are asking about is just like, can I vote on this thing or not? We'll give you a ruling, that way you know, the, and you can share your advice with anybody that you want. You might want to show your fellow board members that you got Got advice from us. We'll never share your advice with anybody because that's what the law uh, guarantees that we will do, but you can share your advice with anybody. And the other reason why you want to call us for advice is that you want to avoid the enforcement process. The other part of our office is involved in prosecutions of violations of the conflict of interest law. I'm happy to say we have not had very many community board member enforcement cases, but we've had a couple, um, more than just a couple, and uh, not a lot though. Uh, anyway, you want to avoid the enforcement process because you don't want to deal with the uh, a, a possible civil penalty of up to $25,000 that I've never seen that high of a case for a community board member, but we don't want any test or, you know, first times. Um, uh, and criminal prosecution could also happen, although that's very rare. Uh, sometimes the DA prosecutes, usually it's a very big fish who's violated in a big way. They prosecute it as a crime. And that's not us, right? We're just a little administrative law agency. The DA does whatever the DA is going to do. We step out of the way. But anyway, you're not going to worry about that. Why? Because you're going to call us for advice and you're gonna, never going to have to talk to people about enforcement. Now, what are the big things that people call about from a community board? It's about discussions and voting. Those are the two big things we got to hit tonight. And that's what we're going to hit right now. So good news on discussions, also good news on voting, but but just a little more complicated. So here we go. Um, on voting, you may not vote when you have a conflict. OK, pretty simple. Now, you may participate in the discussion always um, uh, uh, when you have a conflict of interest. Uh, um, um, uh, it, and there might be one time where you can't participate in discussion, uh, and that is if you're attempting to contract directly with the community board. But, but let's put a tack in that, because in all other cases, you can, uh, um, which is very hard to do, by the way. You need a waiver to do it. And I, I wouldn't even, I, that's a can of worms I'm going to say for the end, because it's so, it's, uh, it's not that it doesn't happen. It hardly ever happens. But in most other cases, all other cases, you can participate in the discussion, even if you have a conflict, but you must disclose your conflict. And you, when do you disclose it? Not after the vote, not right before the vote. You disclose your conflict uh, uh, and then you participate in the discussion. Right. So you can always discuss if you disclose. And that's it. The end. Ta da. I'll just be collecting my paycheck now. Just kidding. We now have to define a few things. Conflict. What is a conflict? Well, a conflict in this law means that um, the issue that you're voting on would cause a direct economic gain or mitigation of loss for your own financial interests or 
of the financial interests of someone with whom you are associated. And with that, ta-da, the end, except no, we're not really, because now we got to talk about what is an associate, which is actually a review. An associate is this, spouse, child, parent, sibling, or anyone with whom you have a financial relationship. And then it goes into, so we saw from that list before, client, business partner, debtor, creditor, landlord, tenant, employer, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's what an associate is. So you can't vote if it's going to affect your bottom line or the bottom line of somebody on this list. Okay, now, financial conflicts, when you can't vote. This is, this is a review of that exact same slide. It's got the same things on it. These are the people when you've got a conflict, it's because bottom line two is going to be affected directly by uh, one of, or, or going to affect these one of these parties directly. Now, direct, that's an important word. Direct, direct, direct. Uh, way, the way the law is written is I can't vote when there is a direct economic gain or mitigation of a loss to that thing that either is my bottom line or the bottom line of an associated party. And so it, it's, that's very clear under the law. And I'm going to give a couple of examples here, or at least one example that sort of plays this out. It's one I've used before. Um, so indulge me here for a second. You know, I will confess to you that I didn't always want to be the guy who uh, uh, was the windbag for the conflict of interest board's education efforts. No, I had dreams and maybe one day I'll, I'll execute those dreams. My dream was to uh, own a tiki bar. And, um, and and furthermore, I have another dream. Not only will I be a tiki bar owner, but I'm also going to be on a community board. And the question comes up, I need my liquor license re-upped. It's going to go before the community board uh, where I sit as a community board member. Can I vote on my own liquor license application? No. Why? Because that's the direct effect on my own interest. I own the bar. We're voting on my liquor license, so I cannot vote on that. I, I disclose, hey, that's my bar. I am free to discuss. This is why you should re-up my liquor license because of all the outstanding you know, work I've, I've done in the community and how great uh, just for the soundscape you know, in your neighborhood my bar has been in the late evening um, uh, or whatever you want to say. You discuss and then you don't vote. But remember, it's direct that you can't vote on. So the question is, what if some other person, uh, some other, you know, you know, washed up public servant uh, wants to open a tiki bar using, by the way, my signage, I'm going to get him on some intellectual property case, but I'm not going to get him on, on, on um, uh, this uh, uh, a whole other issue. Um, uh, forget I said that. Here's what I mean. Um, uh, my point is this, when we talk about direct, what this means is that one might say, well, you know, this guy's a competitor. He's got a bar close to you. Maybe you should be precluded from voting on it because maybe down the line, if he gets his liquor license approved, that could dig into your business. But we don't know that, right? That is a putative potential uh, effect on your financial interests. I don't own this bar. So can I vote on this liquor license application? You bet I can. And that's the way the law is written. It's too complicated. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't figure out whether or not having two tiki bars next together is going to turn this into the tiki bar capital of Queens. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll both win on this. I, who knows? We don't know. We have no idea if it's going to have any effect whatsoever. So you can vote on somebody else's liquor license application. You can't vote on your own. Um, even in this stupid example that I gave to you here. Let's uh, now, so what do you do? Disclose, hey, that's my bar. Discuss, participate in discussions and do not vote. Now, here's another example. I sit on the board of the of MoMA, Museum for Modern Art, maybe for the Socrates Sculpture Park, something like that, um, for design expertise, obviously. Look at this presentation. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, I'm not paid by MoMA, but remember, I am associated with MoMA if I sit on the board. And so what's going to happen here is the same thing. Hey, I sit on the board of MoMA. I then discuss the issue. This funding thing that you want DCLA to give to MoMA for Socrates Sculpture Park, I think it's a great idea. I support the resolution. Uh, you bet I'm going to vote yes. Or, or you bet I would vote yes if I could, but then I can't because I'm associated with MoMA. So the rest of you should, even though I can. Okay. All right. Now, here's the other thing I was talking about that's not a financial interest. Now we're going to move into to a different thing that I'm calling conflicts of office. Here's what I mean. If you work for a governmental or quasi-governmental agency, like you work for the city of New York for an agency, if you work for the state of New York, if you work for the UN, if you work for the post office, there's some other ones, there'll be a list here in a second. And something comes up where you're making a direct request for action or whatever to the agency where you work at, you cannot vote on that thing. 
Um, the classic example is like, let's say I work for DOT and now we're gonna ask DOT to put a speed bump on a street. Um, uh, I certainly can participate in the discussions as long as I disclose I work at DOT, but when, when it comes to a vote on the request, I cannot vote on that issue. Why? Well, because all of the votes of the community board should have the appearance and reality that they didn't weren't, weren't influenced from the outside. They should be unsullied by some other outside interest. And when I'm working 40 hours a week for DOT, and I'm also voting on a DOT issued community board, it can be a little bit difficult to disentangle the motivations of the vote there, right? They may be subject to at least some suspicion that DOT had a man on the inside, et cetera. And so to preclude that from happening, that the government employee just doesn't vote on an issue related to the agency where they work at. And it's things on this list, federal, state, local um, uh, um, uh, agencies, public authorities, CUNY, SUNY, other public universities, UN post office, charter schools, local development corporations, Brooklyn Public Library, Queens Public Library. If you work for one of, the, one of those things and you're gonna vote on something related to one of those things, then you just disclose the scuffs and you don't vote, which is the same slide we saw before. Also, do not represent, like let's say DOT now needs a representative to come out and explain the complexities of the speed bump issue to the rest of the community board. That's fine, but they can't have me do it. I'm the community board member who happens to be on DOT, but for the meeting, I need to stay a community board member. If DOT needs somebody to come out and do this thing, they should bring somebody else to do that because it's kind of weird and it sends a weird kind of picture like, hey, I'll take my CB hat off and now I'm gonna be a DOT guy for a second. What happens if I wanna question myself? You know, what am I doing? Um, so anyway, uh, and that's true for all conflicts, right? So if you're, you know, your, your, your brother is, uh, uh, applying for a zoning variance and he needs a representative to talk to the community board about the zoning variance. He can't have you do it because you're the community board member. Okay, same thing. All right, now uh, use the three Ds, disclose, discuss, don't vote. That's our summary. Now let's talk about chairing the, co the community board. CB chairs can have conflicts like anybody else. Uh, they're going to use the three Ds like anybody else. But the difference here is that if I'm the chair and I've got a, a conflict coming up for the meeting, I cannot be chair of the entire meeting not just of one part of that meeting. As you know better than I do probably, the chair has a certain amount of power to set the agenda. So it has to be not chair for the whole meeting, not just on the issue where I've used the three Ds. And let's talk about committees. If the same thing, like if I'm a chair of committee, issue comes up where I gotta use the three Ds then I am not chair of that meeting for the whole meeting, not just for my issue. And the other thing, and this is relatively new, um, the law used to say that if you had to use the 3Ds a lot on a committee, then you can't be the chair of the committee. And then a lot of board members ask, well, what do you mean by a lot? Well, they clarified that a couple of years ago in a rulemaking thing. And so if I've got to use the 3Ds uh, three times or more in a calendar year, then I cannot be the chair of the committee. I can serve on the committee. I can serve on any committee, but I can't serve as the chair of that committee. So here's an example. Let's say I'm a DOE teacher. Uh, my input would probably be very valuable on a youth services or education committee. Um, but because of the high likelihood that there are going to be many issues concerning the Department of Ed that come before the education committee, I'm not going to be able to be the chair of that committee because I'm going to have to use the 3Ds on a fairly regular basis. And remember, if you've got to use the 3Ds on one part of the meeting, you can't be the chair of the entire meeting. So effectively, effectively if you've got to use the 3Ds every time, you're never being the chair anyway. You, you get what I'm saying? So um, uh, anyway, so three times or more. You can't be the chair of the committee, but you can be on any committee of, uh, that you're selected for or that you choose. OK, now voting vote tabulation. This is uh, there's not a lot of conflict of interest law on in this, but I'm going to talk about this because uh, conflicts of interest law affects voting. So here we go. The big thing is that conflicts don't affect the quorum, but they do affect your vote tabulation. So what do you need for a quorum? You need 50% plus one people to show up, right? So if 26 people show up, hallelujah, you've got a quorum. Now at this particular quorum, on this particular vote, there are three community board members on one issue that have a conflict of interest. That's gonna affect your vote tally. It doesn't affect your quorum because 26 people are still in the room. 26 people are still gonna participate in the discussions if they disclose, but you're not gonna have a problem with maintaining quorum even though the number of tallyable votes on three um, uh, th with three conflicted people is gonna go down by three. Now, what am I talking about here? All right, so step one, 
you got three people who've got a, a who are going to participate in discussions. They're not going to vote. So before participating in discussions, they're going to disclose their conflict. Three conflicted members then participate in discussion with the other 23 members who are qualified to vote. And the three community board members do not vote. Quorum is maintained since all participated or all attended, I should say. Um, OK, so. Conflicted members of a quorum may not vote. Now, to pass, you need more yes votes than no's and abstentions combined. Remember, you need a majority of yes votes on the issue out of the pool of qualified votes to pass an issue. Now, with 26 people present and no conflicts, normally you need 50% plus one, so that's 13 plus one. You need 14 yes votes to pass an issue. But now, with the three conflicts, there are only 23 eligible votes in the room. 23 and a half is 11 and a half, so you round up. Now we need 12 yes votes to pass this issue. Uh, conflicts affect vote tally. They do not affect quorum. That's what I mean uh, when I say that, and that's how we laid it out. Now, remember... Uh, another way to slice it is this way. When you are eligible to vote, you can vote three ways. You can you can vote yes, you can vote no, or you can abstain. And remember, no's are essentially counted with abstentions. If you have more no's and abstentions in the room, then the issue fails because you did not get a majority of yes votes on the issue. When you are ineligible to vote due to conflict of interest, um, you cannot vote yes, you cannot vote no, and you cannot abstain. Those are not available to you. Um, um, okay, so now other topics, super quick. Do you know who I am is a phrase best left inside your head. Um, uh, you know, we get titles, we get email addresses. Some of us get business cards. Um, some of us still use them. Uh, I got a box in my office collecting dust, but maybe that's pandemic related. In any case, um, um, they really only can be used for community board purposes. Certainly there have been cases of officials of various sorts using badges or identification to try to get special treatment, whether that was special treatment from the taxi service or special treatment from the cops or whatever, we're not supposed to use our city position for something other than what it's supposed to be used for. So no special treatment, no, do you know who I am? Do you, I'm going to come get you. I'm a community board member. Uh, some of us don't have to worry about this. Like if I, I mean, can you imagine like say like I'm at a demonstration and, and I get uh, you know, are arrested at a demonstration. I say, you can't arrest me. I work for the conflict of interest board. I probably will get worse treatment. But in any case, um, uh, uh, even for people who have fancy, powerful titles, uh, we can't use them to get special treatment. Now, let's talk about gifts for just a second. Um, this sentence I like very much. I crafted it myself. Gifts offered by... Uh, I crafted everything it's myself but in any case gifts offered by dint of community board service should be refused if somebody wants to hook you up because you are a community board member you should not take it um and this example here i think or these pair of examples sort of lays out what's probably fine and what's not fine um the first one green because it's probably fine Juan's a community board member for a long time he's been a regular at the dino's a bar in his neighborhood i don't know why it's the dino's probably this this idiot didn't type it right. Occasionally, the bartender buys Juan around. You know what? Bartender probably doesn't know Juan is a community board member. The bartender might not even like Juan. Uh, uh, the bartender is giving Juan a comp because he wants Juan to get give him more tips. And you know how I know this? I was a bartender and I comped lots of drinks to people who I did not like talking to. Some of them I did, but not all of them. Um, uh, in any case, Juan is not being uh, uh, comped here because he's a community board member. This is a business strategy the bar uses to generate goodwill and, good, and repeat customers. Now, Juan, in the second example, Juan, Juan receives an invitation for a free dinner at the North Star, a new eatery in the neighborhood seeking a liquor license, and Juan's going to go there on a yummy fact-finding mission. That's probably not okay. Juan is basically being offered this because the new eatery knows that he's there. They want to buy some goodwill. They want to see all the great stuff that they do. That's not allowed. Now, if questions come in about this because there are, let's say, gifts to the community board and you're not sure how to dispose of them and, and uh, um, you know, maybe there's Mets tickets that come in and there's a question about how to distribute them and then who can participate in the program and how that stuff works. And we're game for all that. We'll give you advice on everything. But I think the default is that if you're getting a gift and, 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 and it's not from somebody of the life you had before a community board member giving you the same thing that they would give you even if you weren't a community board member you probably need to ask us about that before you take it there have been community board gifts cases there was 
a big one in Manhattan a few years ago involving a community board member who received a two-year membership at a very swanky club called the Soho House, a club that I had never heard of that apparently was featured in Sex in the City, a show I have never seen. And, and she admitted in the disposition the only reason she got this hookup of this free membership was because she was a community board member and she paid a pretty hefty fine because the you know, the membership was a lot of money. So be careful with gifts. We'll give you advice. The ones that you can accept, you'll have the advice that you can accept them. So if anybody asks a question, you can show them you, the advice that you got. And if you can't accept it, you'll know that too. And that's good because then you don't risk uh, violating the law. Representing private clients before the community board. Remember, like I said before, you can't take off your community board hat and represent a private client before the community board or your agency or your business or your whatever, right? You're always speaking as a community board member. If you have a firm where your firm is going to represent one of your clients, you got to ask for a waiver from the COIB to do that. It's probably possible. You just got to erect a wall that basically isolates you from any work on the project of the client that it has before the community board. We'll lay that out in the waiver, just comply with the waiver. So that's pretty easy to do. Go to our website, we'll get you a waiver if that comes up. If your firm that you own is going to represent a client that has that has a matter before the community board. Okay. Now, community board staff. Uh, you can't get into a financial relationship with community board staff. You can't get into a friend, you can't loan money to a district manager. You can't represent the district manager in court. You can't sell them real estate, you can't sell them a car, you can't politically politically solicit. The community board staff. You can't even ask them to participate in a political campaign. You can't ask them how to vote, can't ask them for money, can't ask them to go to a rally. And then also there's another part in the city charter that says that close relatives of community board members may not serve as community board staff um, uh, for obvious reasons, because the community board has some say in the appointment and, and hiring and firing of that staff. So that leads to problems of relatives supervising relatives. Okay, doing business with the community board. Uh, recently, the sort of structure of the way the community board is involved in the disbursement of city funds has changed a little bit. Not only do you ask agencies to fund things, but you have some money to fund things yourselves. Now, that puts you in an interesting situation because you've got all kinds of interesting people who do all kinds of interesting things for the community. Be very careful here. It might seem like a great fit that your one community board member has a business or a not-for-profit that perfectly supplies the services that you need, and therefore you want to contract or give a grant to that uh, particular entity. Um, I, you, that person, that community board member who wants to get money directly from the board where they serve needs a waiver to do that. That's only can happen with a waiver from us. And the waiver is going to say, if that community board is going to do that, they can't participate in discussions. They can't participate in voting. They've got to really just be for that issue, like a person in the private sector getting this grant or this money. It doesn't happen very often, folks. And I'll tell you why. New York's a big place. I am from a small town in Kansas where maybe there was one caterer growing up. There's probably more now. But, uh, you know, that that's a different vibe right here in New York. I mean, to say like, oh, it's only this community board member who could cater this event like that is a I don't know, a little crazy maybe. But you know what? I'm not the board. I'm not the one who gets, makes the calls on the waivers. I'm just saying these waivers are a little harder to come by. Um, you can always ask though. Seeing to do business with the community board directly is a hard waiver to get. Uh, if your community board member and you're, you've got a firm and your firm wants to represent a client, and as long as you can actually structure the recusal correctly, that's an easier waiver to get. Uh, go to nyc.gov and get the ball rolling there. nyc.gov slash ethics there. That's our website. You can talk to us there. A lot of questions coming in. I'll answer them all in chat. I'm going to keep moving. I'm almost done. Um, okay. This is a weird one to bring up. It's about job seeking job interviews. What the law says is that you can't, um, uh, you can't discuss possible future employment with a firm that you're currently dealing with in your city duties. Now for the purposes of community board service, I'm going to reverse that for a second with the following example. Let's say Veronica, who sits on a community board in, let's say, Manhattan, Upper Manhattan, where Columbia like owns everything, right? So she is on, in this Upper Manhattan um, uh, community board, and she's also seeking. She's in kind of active negotiations with Columbia uh, to uh, become a tenure track architecture professor at Columbia University, or she would like to apply for the tenure track position. 
when in the middle of those negotiations, which I imagine, you know, working for Columbia is like winning the lottery, right? And it's a, probably a very intense process. It takes a lot of time. For the enti- entirety of the application process where Veronica is seeking to get a job with Columbia, she can't vote on a Columbia related matter. And that's my point is if you're seeking a job with the firm right now, you got to use the three D's. You can't, you got to, you got to disclose and then you can discuss, but you can't vote. You do not vote. Um, okay. So um, now one last thing, leaving the community board. Uh, everybody knows about the post-employment restrictions in government, the revolving door restrictions, we call them. It's the magic numbers one year, but remember you leave the community board, you can come back to a private or a public meeting. You can uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about at the public meeting. All you can't do is you can't for compensation represent other people at the community board meeting. So you can't be their representative, paid representative, but you can come back to a public meeting and, and speak your mind. Um, how do you get your questions answered? Well, you call us or you email us. Here's the contact information. If you prefer to live in the 20th century, then you can use that old teleo phone. Call us nine to five Monday through Friday. If you are nostalgic for things pre 20th century, then you can write us a letter right here. We will answer it whenever we get it. Um, and then that's a dig and lose. Joy can tell. And then um, if you prefer to live in this, what has recently been a nightmare of a 21st century, then you can uh, go on the interwebs right here. Um, we've got a big button on the homepage. It says, get legal advice, hit that, type in your question and it's going to go right to us and we'll get back to you in a very timely fashion. And with that, I have gotten through everything I needed to get through. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump off this call. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to start answering these questions invisibly in the chat. Um, is that OK with you, Madam Chair? Uh, that's fine, Mr. Kip. That's what okay. you prefer. And we'll continue with our meeting if you don't mind. Sounds good. That's what I would prefer. Thank you very much for your time today, everybody. Have a great Thank rest you. of your meeting. Thank you. Okay, public hearing item. BSA calendar number 6690BZ4303 Astoria Boulevard, application for a term of 15 years to permit the per- premises to be occupied for gasoline service station to be continued. Uh, someone um, here from Platnick? Yep, Elise Holader from our Platnick's office. I can share my screen to show you what the plans look like. If- that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no problem here. Share. And here's the proposed. You can see that, right? Or you can see the plans, right? I can see them, yes. Okay. You don't see a fa- statement of facts. You see the plans, right? I see the plans. Um, See what see that's I, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I will begin then. So, this is an application for forty three zero three Astoria Boulevard in Queens. Um, it's at Block seven eighty, Lot eighteen. It's filed pursuant to eleven four eleven of the New York City um, Zoning Resolution to extend the term of the variance that was previously granted. Um, it's in an R five zoning district. And it's a gasoline service station with accessory uses. It's a mobile station with um, a convenience store and a Dunkin' Donuts. Um, It has been under the board's jurisdiction since 1959. The term was last extended uh, January 25th, 2011, and it expired on October 1st, 2020. This is, uh, we're not seeking any changes. We're just seeking to extend the term another 10 years. Um, It has a 1,700 square foot building that has a convenience store and a Dunkin' Donuts. It it operates as a gasoline and and the stores all operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, And it is um, a full service gasoline service station. So there's always someone outside on premises because it is 24 hours, but there's always someone around because it's a full service station. Um, and I am, I could show, look at the plans here. You can see what it looks like. It has three islands. Uh, it's at the corner of Astoria and 43rd street. Um, I can show you, they recently got new signage, but you can see here where the sales area is and there's a restroom. Um, 
can see what it looks like. Trying to make water there. Um, here are the signages, and here's um, the maneuverability plan. And um, that is my entire presentation. And I would love to answer any questions about this site. Okay, th thank you, Louise. Uh, some, uh, someone needs to mute their audio. Can we see who that is, please? Yeah, I've muted a couple of people, but at least I don't know if you have something in the background or. I don't think so. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sounds better now. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you, Louise. Um, I'll turn over uh, the questions for the time being to uh, Jerry Caliendo. Um, Jerry? Jerry, you got to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so the, the only question I really have, it seems that the gas station has been kept in pretty good shape mm -hmm. over the years. And I know it came up in previous discussions and previous um, uh, extension in terms of the variance about uh, the bathrooms and so forth in the back of the building. I actually asked the owner about that because Florence brought it up with me about just as a safety thing. And the owner said, uh, well, I apologize. They couldn't make it tonight. And the operator is traveling in Greece right now. So apologies. They couldn't make it tonight. But they said they make sure to only when someone requests a key, can they use the bathroom? It's not kept open. Good. So the, the only other thing that I want to mention, though, is is not really a question, but a statement that, in fact, the. Recent resolutions all stated that the conditions of the previous or the, the earlier back in the 90s approvals should be kept up to date and, mm -hmm. and are relevant. And, and they are basically, there should be no car sales and they should be, I just want to mention this so that it's on the record that it just mm -hmm. doesn't say that the old conditions apply, the board should know, our board and the BSA should recognize that we're still interested in those conditions, and they are, that there be no car sales on the property, mm -hmm. uh, sidewalk and curb shall be repaired, that the premises shall be kept free of debris, landscaping shall be kept in accordance with the BSA approved plans and shall be maintained and replaced as necessary. And the garbage dumpster in the rear should be screened with 100% opaque screening. And that the fence on the east side of the property has 100% screening. Then when I look at, when I went to the property and I look at Google Maps, in the back of the building, there's fence, fencing which prevents you know, people from going to the back of the building but it's not completely opaque. So that's not, it's not a difficult thing to do. You just need to put the slats, but it's not there and today I, and it should be added. And so that I can definitely mention to the operator and the owner, that seems like an easy fix. Right, that's I all I have. The, and I should also add as a condition of the board in addition, and it's been kept that way, but I just wanna add it for the record that the building should be kept um, uh, free of graffiti, and all lighting should be kept away from the adjoining, directed away from the adjoining residential um, uh, buildings. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I Thank see you. some questions in the chat, so I'll okay. answer those. Okay, I, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. If you have a question, board members, could you use the raise hand function? Okay. So we can all hear it. I can I read them too if you need. I think Diana had a question. Diana? Some of the Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I put in the chat if there were restroom facilities there for drivers, which I think was addressed um, a little earlier on. Um, yes. Like, I just wanted to know if there were restroom facilities. You know, if you're on the highway and you need to get out and your kid needs to pee, excuse me, you know, they need to go to the bathroom. Um, 
like, are those accessible? So the answer is yes, but because of safety concerns from previous applications in front of your board, you have to get a key. You have to request a key and then they'll give it to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I see one, we have one more question about electric car charging stations. Those Which, have actually, we've struggled with those with a lot of our gas stations trying to put it in because of zoning. So I, there is not. <laughs> okay. And an ATM with a swipe function? That I have no idea I'd have to I, I, I imagine that everybody yeah. will be upgrading to those. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then I uh, see the la last question is it says, it, is it fully accessible? I assume that means ADA and there is an ADA parking space. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Louise. I see no more questions. We're going to close this hearing and vote on it during the business section. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> May I get in the uh, motion to adopt the September 2021 minutes, please? Motion. Second. Second. You want to pose? No, thank you. Madam Chair, names for the first and second, please. I could not identify who they were. Who made uh, the motion? Dino for the first. It was Dino. Antonella. Second. For the second. And Antonella. Thank you. Thank you. A chair's report. I really don't have a report. I just I want to focus on November 2nd is election day. Um, early voting starts October 23rd until the 31st. I believe the open voting, open voting sites here are early voting rather at the Boys Club and at the Museum of the Moving Image. But you can get all that information on vote.nyc. Thank you. Juan? Hi, everybody. It's great to see you again this month. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Breast cancer affects people from all walks of life. Men and women are affected. In 2022, new breast cancer diagnoses are expected to number more than 200,000 for women and more than 2,000 for men. In our district, we have multiple resources. Mount Sinai Hospital Queens has online videos in social media for how to do proper self screenings. Elmhurst Hospital also has a facility which works with Sharing and Caring, a not for profit whose founding member was our own Lucille Hartman, district manager and former board member, Anna Krill, which was founded in 1994, along with several of our present past and board members who have sat on their board. Sharing and Caring can be reached at 718-777-5766, and their services are free of charge. As I said, this is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and the 114th Precinct has a domestic violence division to assist people at risk and in situations which require services. They have resources and are available for consultations and referrals. The phone number there is 718 626-9316. New York City's 24-hour hotline is 800-621-HOPE, provided by New York City Human Resources Administration. Please friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter to receive important information and updates. Please always visit our website for board meeting information. And please do not forget to vote Tuesday, November 2nd, as the chair noted, early voting is available. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. I did want to mention one more thing. Wednesday, October 28th, 6 to 8 p.m., the Queens Borough President's Office will have a violence awareness event for domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Committee report. Airport. I don't think uh, Rosemary had a report. Is that correct, Mom? No, Rosemary does have a report. She well, may be having a hard time. Can you hear me time. now? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm, nobody has trouble hearing my voice, thank God. <laughs> okay, yes, I have a brief uh, report. Uh, though the FAA had recently approved the controversial LaGuardia Air Train, a $2 billion-plus project bankrolled by former Governor Cuomo, 
the Port Authority has met with several recent unexpected obstacles, namely Governor Kathy Hochul, Senator Michael Giannaris, Senator Jessica Ramos, Senator Leroy Camry, and other elected officials mindful and alert to their constituents' valid concerns, which have been endlessly voiced from the very beginning by the Dittmar's Boulevard Block Association. The light rail link would, if it ever reaches fruition, connect trains from Manhattan's number subway, su- number seven subway line to Willits Point at City Field, directly to LaGuardia Airport over portions of the Grand Central Parkway. I quote the most recent statement issued from the Port Authority. At Go- and I quote, At Governor Hochul's request, the Port Authority is undertaking a thorough review of potential alternative mass transit options to LaGuardia Airport. The agency will work in close consultation with independent experts and stakeholders and will complete its work as expeditiously as possible, consistent with the needs for the review to be thorough and rigorous. During the review, the Port Authority will pause further action with respect to the Guardia Air Train Project. End quote. So goes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rosemary. Union Economic Development. Mackenzie, do you have a report? No, there's no report right now. Thank you. Thank you. Consumer Affairs, do you know Panagulia? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I believe Florence had shared with everyone uh, all of the licenses that are up for vote this evening. Uh, yesterday, we had a Consumer Affairs Committee meeting. We had three businesses attend the meeting. These were uh, Rotana Cafe and Lounge doing business as After 8 Cafe, the Oven Chill Grill doing business as Oven Chill Grill Lounge, and the owners and representatives of Vibes uh, Astoria. We had conversations with all three of the owners and their representatives. We expressed to them a number of concerns that we had, namely a uh, number of increased 911 and 311 calls. Uh, we as a committee, uh, after hearing their side of the story and the improvements that they were saying that they were going to implement, namely increasing the amount of security guards uh, that they have available for the business and a number of other improvements, we voted to move forward and approve uh, the recommendation for renewal of their liquor license. And so what I'd like to do is make a motion to move forward uh, with a vote to, in fact, approve all the licenses that are on your spreadsheets for today. Do, do I have a second on that motion? I second. Can you leave seconds? All in favor or anyone opposed, rather, please raise your hand. Do a raise hand function. Why do I? I keep picking up all. Okay, seeing none, uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dina. Oh. Environmental protection, Antonella or Dominic? Um, I have a short, re- well, I have a short report, but then, Madam Chair, if I can have your permission, I have two community members that wanted me to say something, and it's going to be less than two, two minutes. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. Yes, okay. Antonella, I will time you two minutes ago. Thank you. Well, after my... Joking. <laughs> joking. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, so at the monthly QSWAP meeting, we were informed that the Department of Sanitation would be rolling out brown bin organic composting this month, but CB1 is not part of the rollout. And we'll report back if this changes. Um, between October 18th and the 29th, about 120 subway and park locations will be tested with, a low, con- with low concentrations of pre- presumably, hopefully, safe gas. It's a Department of Homeland Security project along with city agencies and the MTA and part of the Urban Threat Dispersion Program and the Chemical and Biodefense Testbed Program. There's no list of exact locations, but it's entirely possible that testing will occur in our area. 
just wanted to let people know because people do commute back and forth uh, on the subway. Um, I was asked by my fellow community members, among them a registered nurse and a New York City public school teacher to speak about their concerns at this board meeting. They have since lost their jobs because of the vaccine mandate. They both have recovered from COVID and were told by their doctors that they have natural immunity. Natural immunity is something that is not even, not, not even Fauci is disputing. According to the governmental database VAERS, over 16,000 people have died with, from the vaccine along with 48,000 from the Medicare database of seniors die, dying within 40, 14 days of receiving the shot. Former CDC Director Robert Redfield announced yesterday that 40% of recent COVID deaths in Maryland were with people who had both shots. Given all the deaths and injuries and the fact that we know that the vaccine does not prevent the spreading of COVID, and because there are other proven ther therapies available like monoclonal antibodies, we should reopen the discussion and have our politicians hold hearings and revisit these mandates. Our businesses are suffering because people with natural immunity can't frequent them. Folks are losing the ability to feed their families, but more importantly, people are dying and being seriously injured from the vaccine. It may work for some, but not all. Where there is a risk, there needs to be a choice. I'm, I'm posting back up for all, to all my statements in the chat in the chat if anyone's interested, including studies and articles and all that stuff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Antonella. Health and Human Services, Judy. No, no report. Housing, Evie Hunzopoulos. Um, no report, but I'm wondering if we can publish the dates of the meetings that have been calendared on the website so that people can know ahead of time, not just when the agenda is ready. So I just noticed that we don't have the dates for future meetings, not just for my committee, but for all the committees. So I'm wondering if we can just add that. I thought the committee dates were up there, but I'll talk to you while it's offline. Thank you, Evie. Land use and zoning, Chevy Caliendo. Yes, um, regarding the application in front of us for BSA calendar number, bear with me. Um, I'm sorry, I should have been prepared. I have the calendar number, Debbie, 6690 BC. Thank you. Uh, make a motion to approve with the conditions formally stipulated by the BSA, which include the following, that uh, no car sales be permitted on the premises, uh, sidewalks and curbs be repaired, uh, premises be kept free of debris, landscaping should be in accordance with the BSA plans and maintained and replaced as necessary. Garbage dumpsters are to be screened, 100% opaque screening, um, and all lighting be uh, directed away from the neighboring uh, residential properties, and that the building and property be kept graffiti free. We have a second. I'll, I'll second. second. Okay, I think that was Jeffrey. I second. No, oh, and, and George, okay. Um, Amy Howe, can you do the um, Hi. Hi. Um, hi, hi everyone. Um, okay, roll call. Um, Helene Abiola. I believe she's absent. I see. Uh, Roseanne Alifajanis. Also absent. George Alexiu. Yes. Thank you, Daniel Alberti. Um, I, I had a. I was trying to ask a question uh, about what Jerry had said. I wanted a clarification on where it said no sales of cars. Does that include no advertising of sales of cars as well? Um, that was not stipulated in the board, but I think that that should be included. Um, it's it's a gas station. It has an accessory, um, a convenience store. 
but I believe the intent from the board was it's only going to be a gasoline sh station for fueling as well as the convenience store. That's it. Okay, so if you want it, I'll maybe, we should, maybe we should add in no, uh, no sale or adver advertising of, say, you know, car. I don't believe it's happening now, but I'm not adverse to adding that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then I'm, I'm a yes. Okay. And George Alexio, you're still on there. Yes, on this revised stipulation? No, yes. Yes. So, Madam Chair, we can continue with this. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Andy Ajla? Yes. Not, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Louise Bordley? She's absent. Uh, Shoma? Shoma? And like got popular and doing stuff like Try to come back. Yes, come back. I, I um, thought she was on the sorry, floor. I, do yeah, I thought I saw her on the panelist okay. list, but I'm not sure if they're there. Uh, and Bruno? She's absent. Olivia, she was on the panelist list. Yeah, she was. Who was? Shoma? Shoma. Yeah, she was. All right. Uh, we'll come back to Shoma. Uh, Jerry Caliendo? Yes. Thank you. Iraq? John yeah. Yes. Thank you. Jim Marie Deleva? Like yes. Thank you. Antonella De Severio? Antonella? Yes. Yes. Katie Elman? Yes. Liz Arion? Absent. Mackenzie Farqua? Yes. Thank you. Dean Veratovic? Yes. Shahanas Handy? Yes. Thank you. Evie Hansopoulos? Yes. Amy Hauser, yes. Helen Ho? Yes. Thank you. Vanessa Jones Hall? Absent. Richard Kasumi? Kuzami. Kuzami and yes. <laughs> I've only been pronouncing your name, I don't know how many <laughs> years. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy Conifal? Absent. Uh, Amar Khat? Yes. Thank you. Jerry Krill? Yes. Thank you. Christina Lastras? I believe she's absent, Amy. Diana Lemongi? Yes. Thank you. Chelsea Lopez? Yes. Hannah Lupian? Yes. Jeffrey Martin? Yes. Thank you. Amin Mahedi? I believe he's absent. Uh, Tony Maloney? Absent. Doreen Hom Mohammed? Doreen is here. Yeah, she I saw her here. earlier. Doreen Mohammed. You vote, please. Come back, Amy. Okay. Uh, Eric Mouche. Absent. Stella Nicolau. Yes. Thank you. Mary O'Hara. Absent. Dino Panagoulis. Yes. Thank you. Juliet Payab. Yes. Thank you. Rosemary Povaromo? Yes. Thank you. Yone Robinson? Absent. Uh, Brian Romero? No uh, Thomas Ryan? Absent. Thank you. Dominic Stiller? Yes. Thank you. Andre Sith? Yes. Thank you. Rot Townsend? Yes. Thank you. Judy Trulavis? Yes. Thank you. Kathleen Warnock? He's absent. Okay. Mitch Waxman? Absent. Rosemary Hilton? Absent. Marie Tornielli? Yes. Thank you. Thank That's you. a total of 30 vote yeses. Thank you so much. The motion carries. Thank you. Sorry. Mm. Parks Recreation, um, Katie Elman. Katie, you have a report? 
no report. We hope to have a meeting um, in November. Thank you. I just jump in. Yeah. Uh, transportation, Mitch is absent, so no report this month. Thank you. Uh, under old business, uh, we're going to be taking a vote on the capital and expense um, budgets uh, presented and resent uh, about a week ago. Uh, can I get a motion to approve? I'll give you a motion to approve, as is. A second. Amy seconds. Okay, thank you, Amy. Anyone opposed? Thank you, motion carries. Elected uh, official representatives, could you use the raise hand function if you need to make a comment or I believe I saw um, Assemblywoman uh, Cameron Maloney. Hi, how are you, Marie? I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, I, I'm sorry, Congresswoman. I'm yes, sorry. Yes, I'm yes. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, very briefly, I'm just leaving uh, Congress. We just voted. Uh, we're up here trying to get a reconciliation bill. We have uh, 1.2 billion for infrastructure, which we desperately need and 3.5 billion for Build Back Better, which has a lot of important things in it, everything from addressing climate change to strengthening the American family, the child care tax credit, and many, many other things. We have been told we have to pare it down. Um, in my committee, we have passed uh, the funding for electrifying the postal fleet and the fleet for the uh, government, moving it to electric using postal offices in their parking lots as charging stations for the rest of the country as we move to a greener environment. That's part of what we're working on. Uh, uh, we will get an agreement. The speaker wants it by October 31st. I think it may take a little longer, but we will get an agreement. It'll be good for Queens. Um, I met yesterday with the, the governor and her staff on the Peaker plant. Uh, trying to get Big Alice closed down, which is polluting so much. We have 28 uh, uh, polluting uh, towers throughout uh, my district, uh, 28 of them. And my, my district in Ocasio-Cortez, I'm putting in legislation, you can only have one per mile. Uh, but I'm working with the governor's office. Uh, she believes there will be an RFP going out in 2020, uh, which we could include uh, going to alternative fuel and uh, closing down the, the big Alice plant, which would be a good thing. Uh, I'm trying to get into all of the public housing developments that I represent, health centers for vaccinations, testing, and I, uh, you know, for, for young people and for just a healthcare center. We have opened one with the floating hospital in Queensbridge. I now have a van, a health van. I'm having trouble. It's totally paid for. It's got the staff. They're ready to go. And I can't get the permit through buildings. It's just red tape, red tape, red tape. And people are dying. It's one of the most under vaccinated places in the whole uh, area of certainly in my district. So I'm trying to get that done um, and, and a lot of other things. But that's a that's the the update right now. I'm trying to get another hearing on the polluting power plants uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, trying to bring the data in and prove how unsafe and terrible it is so that we can move to try to replace them with renewable uh, energy. I know you have a busy, busy time, so I don't want to take up much time. I'm just focused on trying to get that healthcare center into Astoria houses and closing down the Peaker plants and closing down Big Alice. I yield back to Marie, unless you have any questions. Uh, we, well, we thank you for stopping by uh, and taking the time to stop by and all the work you do on behalf of this community. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Nocevino. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Hi, folks. I hope everyone is well. Um, Couple of quick events I will share with you. First of all, tomorrow 
uh, as Florence uh, mentioned, the borough president is hosting a domestic violence awareness um, seminar. Uh, there will be guest speakers here. It is live at Borough Hall from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, please bring your vaccine cards. Um, October 21st, virtual recruitment fair. I think this must be the 14th or 15th that we are doing. Forgive me that I do not know uh, the exact number, but not only um, are we having this many fairs, people are getting jobs. So that's on the 21st at 2 o'clock to 3.30 at virtual, and you'll need to RSVP on our website. Um, on the 21st also, we're having a virtual FEMA and controller claim support uh, webinar where you can uh, log in and get your questions answered. You need to RSVP. That is Thursday the 21st, 4 o'clock to 5.30. And last but not least, on uh, the 21st, live in Borough Hall, we will have the Queens uh, High School Education Recruitment Fair that will be live, and uh, representatives from different high schools will be here. Uh, and thank you, and I, I yield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, District Manager. Thank you, Joe. Mary Jo Biden. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to uh, all the CB1 members. Uh, this is Mary Jo Biden from the Office of State Senator Jessica Ramos. Our office is open, uh, as I told you uh, in the last meeting, but we are still requesting the community members to make phone calls to make an appointment before showing up so that we can avoid overcrowding during this COVID-19 new normal. And um, our phone number is 718-205-3881, or uh, they can also email us at Ramos constituent services team at gmail.com. I will post the contact information on the chat. Our office has just hosted the Andean Summit on Sunday to celebrate the end of Latino American History Month and Indigenous Peoples Day. We are also hosting a Dia de los Muertos event at the Corona Plaza on October 29th at 5 p.m. We are inviting all of you to visit. That's all for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives on the call that would like to speak? Please use the raise hand function. No. Any members of the public who would like to speak? Please use the raise hand function. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Maria. I just noticed you, Maria, from the mayor's office. Hi, yes. Um, I, I... Oh, sorry, I was trying to mute someone else. Yourself. Maria, you have to, Hello? thank you. Okay, go ahead, Hi. go ahead. Hi, sorry. Uh, somebody okay. earlier was talking about um, needing help with a permit with DOB. Maria, that was Carolyn Maloney, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. I'll put her in touch with your office. Yes, please. Thank Left you. Left already. Okay. Yeah. If you, if um, yeah, if you can send me that information, I'll reach out to her, see how we can help her get those that permit. Um, yeah. We, so we are working also with the Day of the Dead, Ayan yeah, Corona Plaza. We're gonna have a procession walk with Queens Museum. So that event will start between four fourteen to eight p.m. There's gonna be many tables, about thirty tables of CBOs and city agencies. Um, there's gonna be music, food and dance, so please, I'm gonna send you the flyer. So if you can just, you know, share it with everyone, I would greatly appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Marua Rigi, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Marua. OK. 
Okay, moving on, call. Can Olivia. everyone hear me? Okay, Marubu, go ahead, please. Sorry, I didn't have the option to unmute until just now. Um, okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm, I, for some reason, I can't turn my camera on, but I just wanted to say, um, hi, my name is Marwa. I'm an outreach coordinator with the Civilian Complaint Review Board. For those of you who may not know what the CCRB is, we are a city government agency that investigates uh, mediates and prosecutes allegations of police misconduct. We investigate um, uh, uh, excessive or unnecessary use of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, or offensive language. Um, so if you, know, if you ever experience or witness police misconduct, you can file a complaint with the CCRB. Um, I will, uh, if possible, I could share uh, some links in the chat just like our, for our resources. I also wanted to mention that this week we're having a week of awareness for the Right to Know Act. So for those of you who may not know, the Right to Know Act was a law that passed in 2018 that outlined some of your rights when you're stopped by the police. You know, um, just to go over, because uh, I, I understand if I just have a couple of minutes, um, so I'll just quickly summarize um, that some of the main components, um, you have the right to know who the officer is if you're being stopped by one, that includes their name, badge number, what precinct they're from, their rank. Um, you know, if they want to search you, but they don't have a warrant or sufficient cause, they must ask for your consent and remind you that you have the right to say no. Um, they should explain the purpose of the interaction. Um, if uh, they should offer you their business card, that business card will have their name, their uh, badge number, their rank, their precinct. Um, and if they don't uh, offer you a business card, you have the right to request one. Um, if a person doesn't speak English or perhaps they have, um, you know, uh, perhaps they're deaf and they communicate through sign language, um, police officers should be providing everyone with language access services because everyone should know um, everything that's going on in the language that they understand. Um, so yeah, we're just, uh, we're having a series of events across the five boroughs just to promote the Right to Know Act on its third anniversary by um, doing pop-ups, uh, handing out flyers and um, resources and so on and so forth. Um, and I just want to end by saying as an outreach coordinator, I give presentations and workshops and I do tablings for events. So if anyone here knows of an organization or an upcoming event where I should, uh, where I can give a workshop or do tabling to provide free giveaways and free resources for the public, please let me know. I'm going to share my uh, contact information in the chat. Um, and that, that is all. So uh, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Uh, Deborah Farrington. Deborah. Hi, good evening. I just wanted to say hello and uh, let everyone know, even though we're winding down towards the end of the term, we are still working with constituents, Please feel free to call 718-383-9566. Again, 718-383-9566. Or you can email jvandrema at council.nyc.gov. We are working from the office, but are closed to constituents. So please feel free to call, email, and someone will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jebra. Good to hear your voice. Thank you. Good to be seen. Um, back to the public call. Call. One second, I'm allowing okay. you. Yep. Okay. okay, I've been unmuted now. Thank you. So I wanted to register my concerns uh, regarding the Honda program. Um, Dutch Kills is overwhelmed already by uh, our care for the homeless. And we would like the city to apply an equal and fair distribution. Um, this is not a not in my backyard attitude. Uh, I know as a New Yorker that everybody needs to do their part and everybody needs to help with the problem. But Dutch Kills has already taken on more than its share. For years, we've seen a rise in uh, prostitution, uh, defecating and urinating on the sidewalks and in between parked cars, public brawls, verbal harassment, our children being physically harassed. And we have six, uh, we had many more during uh, COVID. We have six shelters currently in our neighborhood. So my question to the board is, how do we get all neighborhoods to do their share, uh, not giving undue burden to Dutch kills? Um, thank you for your comments. Um, we will follow up on this. Um, Perhaps uh, you can, can you put that in uh, writing or an email rather to the board office? 
Yes. Did I lose you. you? Thank you. No. Nope. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oliver Scholar. Oliver? Yes, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes. yes. Uh, evening, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kevin Garcia Ramirez, and I'm just here to talk to you on behalf of Oliver Scholars. Okay. Oliver Scholars, Oliver Scholars is a nonprofit organization that places high achieving Black and Latinx students into private day and boarding schools up and down the East Coast and around the country. Our program uh, is currently is entirely free. Uh, so we provide test prep, placement, and um, academic transition services for, for our students and families. And so we provide all of that at no cost to them. Uh, our program begins in seventh grade, but I will just want to make clear that, you know, we don't limit our outreach to, to seventh graders and families of students in seventh grade. We know that building a strong academic resume is, is a lengthy process. And we, you know, any, any extra time we can give uh, families and students to, to wrap up their, their profile in time for seventh grade, we'd love to uh, have communication with them as early as possible. Uh, we focus on families that demonstrate the most financial need. That are in, and, um, however, we don't have an income cap, but the, the main initiative of our program is to acquire financial aid for families that demonstrate the most financial need from in order to be able to attend these private schools. We work with students from the all five boroughs, uh, but, but only the five boroughs in New York City. A part of our program is a 14th month enrichment session. And we ask families to attend those in person, and students attend them in person. Um, during this time of COVID pandemic, we have definitely had virtual services extended, but going, but in a normal circumstance, we're in person. And so for families outside of New York City, it would be very difficult for them to participate in our program. Uh, we've been doing this for about 30 years. And so that informs a lot of what, a lot of what we do in order to prepare our families. We have a, a constantly evolving social emotional curriculum as well to help prepare our students for that transition. You know, 30 years of doing this, uh, we've learned a lot about the struggles and, and the challenges that our students face uh, in joining in the new environment and the struggles their families face, just kind of acclimating to, to, their, to their child's new environment. And so we have a, that's part of our 14 month enrichment program. We uh, implement a social emotional curriculum and we really try to help our, our students and families prepare for the transition. Um, but not only do we support those families during that transition, we also have support for families and students once they're in schools. We have uh, infrastructure built in and a scholar services department entirely devoted to maintaining awareness of student experiences and the needs of their schools, uh, not only through high school, but college as well. Uh, that has allowed us to build a, a, a strong and thriving alumni network. So we have notable alumni around New York City and around the country. And we really help to uh, expose our students to that network. In college, we also help students acquire a professional experience, professional development, internships of that nature. And so it's really a, a, a lifelong relationship from seventh grade on that we form with these students and these families. I, I so uh, I'm sorry, uh, could you put your contact information into the chat yes, so people could reach out about the program? Sounds like a great program. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie Martinez. Good evening, all. I'm Natalie Martinez, Director of Workforce at Hannig Inc. I'm actually looking for community partners that are interested in working with our Workland Grow Environmental Corp. It's a new program that we just got. Um, we're looking for internships in community gardens, neighborhood beautification, all type of environmental and green jobs. So I'm going to put my contact information in the chat if anybody's interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Hi. Uh, Eleni? Yes, hi. Hi, hi go ahead, please. Thank you in advance for your time and consideration. My name is Eleni Tocanos. I live in the corner of, 20, of 20th Avenue and 45th Street. I'm speaking today to bring to your attention the hazards and dangers of two issues that are both related. One is the Aviation Training Institute Vaughn College located at 4305 20th Avenue. This is a problem that has become a chronic one and exponentially worse since the training center reopened. I was almost personally run over twice by their students in two weeks and I know it was them because I saw them, the drivers, park their cars and then walk into the building nonchalantly as if nothing happened. I called the police, they did not come on a couple of occasions. We've been calling the police. Last week we had to call the police twice. It's been getting escalated and the kids the kids, uh, quote unquote, 
uh, these people who are at this training center, the students there are very aggressive, hostile. I've caught them opening their cars, dumping garbage onto my car, breaking bottles. I look out the window and I say, hey, can you please pick up your garbage? And they get aggressive, loud, and get in my face. I am almost run over by a car twice in two weeks. That is my concern. Um, 20th Avenue is dangerous. It's been used as a raceway for all of the years. I've known people who've died from it over 20 years that I've been living here. We've had residents request speed bumps. Nothing is done. We have requested police patrol. Nothing is done. We have makeshift that have now permanent trailer parks on 45th Street and 43rd Streets. There are constant trailer parks here with people living in there and drug deals happening at all hours of the night. The school across the street is a constant hazard. These kids are speeding and going against traffic, showing off in front of their friends who are standing outside of the building, drag racing from the morning to night. We have seniors with walkers. We have seniors with canes. We have people with dogs. We have kids playing ball, going out into the street. I'm on the corner, so I'm the first person to get hit. And our cars have been hit before. I've had a student's car mow my lawn and my wall and go onto my property when that school opened. It's becoming such a public hazard and nothing is done. We keep calling the police, they shrug their shoulders. I've had meetings with the school very nicely, very civilly. I've gone out to the main campus. I've spoken with people. I've asked them to put garbage cans when it was just a nuisance at the time. They didn't even put a token garbage can just to even say, hey, we are working with you. Not even nothing. So now from a nuisance, it's been escalated to a hazard. They are a public hazard. I've asked them to get a parking lot for their students on the empty lots in the back of the industrial zone. I know my property abuts an industrial zone and I understand there are consequences with that, loud noises and traffic and trucks and buses and fine. You've never seen me at your community board before. The school has been opened. I've complained um, to other officials about the problem with the school. Now I'm almost getting run over. I'm not gonna wait until one of us or my neighbors or myself or my family is gonna get run over by one of these kids speeding up and down this avenue. We have babies in the house with their loud music and their bass and their popping mufflers. We work from home. We don't have a moment's peace. It's affecting my mental health, fighting with these kids one every day. And somebody is gonna get hurt because people are coming into our face because they're kids, they're 17, they're 18, they're 20 years old. Uh, it's Aviation Training Institute. It's the annex from um, Vaughn College, 43-05 20th Avenue. Okay, Eleni, um, have you called uh, the community board office? And if not, uh, could you give Florence a call tomorrow? I, I gave, I, I gave, I spoke with Florence last week. Okay. I believe. Um, I asked when the community board meeting was. Um, I called the councilman's office. They were supposed to get back to me. Somebody called me, but then they were supposed to get back to me. They have not gotten back to me. I've um, called the 114th precinct. It's, 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 it's a no man's land here. There's so much drug dealing and <clears throat> shelters, makeshift uh, trailer parks, and these kids now with just drag racing constantly every single day. Every I'm sorry, can, can you email me that information? I will look into it. And okay, that, that, that was the, uh, the mayor's office. Maria from the mayor's office. Maria so from it, the mayor's office. Maria, call me, call me tomorrow. This is I, Florence. Excuse me, excuse me. Okay, Florence. Okay, Eleni, that was... Um, Maria from the mayor's office. Her contact info is in the chat. Okay. Okay, but I suggest you follow up with our district manager by the end of the week. Who is the see. district manager? That's that's Florence. You just okay. said you spoke, but maybe she'll have more news by the end of the week. Okay. Um. Just yes, Maria. Seven one eight six two six one zero two one. Seven one eight six two six one zero two one. One zero two one. Um, and also Mar Maria's email address. Uh, that's so in I'm the gonna chat. put my email address and my mobile number on the chat so you can have that, okay? Thank and if you can so email me that those complaints and issues, I will look into it for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Steve? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to express the same concerns that Eleni just did. I am at ground zero for this incidents. I live directly across the street from Aviation Training Institute at Vaughan College at 4305 20th Avenue. And my windows look directly at their front door. 
This has been a chronic and ongoing situation since the building opened. It's to the point now where no one at the school will accept my calls. The security uh, guard there has told me that I'm nothing but an old man with nothing better to do than complain. I was really shocked at the idea that when the incident that Eleni uh, described for you and two incidences subsequent to that, the 114th precinct did not respond. I was under the impression that if you called 911, it warrants a response. It, you know, someone needs to come and at least take statements about situations like this. There was a woman waiting here for that incident that was ready to give a statement as a witness to the police, someone that we don't even know who was walking by, who saw what happened. Uh, okay, uh, so Steve, is, I'm gonna, Steve, I'm gonna suggest you also call our district office and speak to Florence. And I would suggest to both you and Eleni to put these comments in writing by email to the board office. All right. Well, I, I, I don't so know we what can else. Follow up. Okay. Because I, I just don't know what else to say about the situation. It's, it's affecting my health. I understand what you're saying. And, and we need to have this documented in writing so the board office can follow up. Okay. Thank you so All much. All right. Th thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Adam? Yes, how you doing, Adam Gohan? Thanks for letting me speak. I wanted to agree with the other two people that just spoke. I live on the same block, 2008 45th Street, and it's true, you know, um, cars racing up and down. I got little kids. I don't feel safe let my let my kids out. You know, it's going downhill since the laws changed in 20 um, in 2020. You know, the quality of life. People smoking marijuana everywhere. People racing. If they could put speed bumps on 20th Avenue, that would be great. Um, I go to the park, I take my kids to the park nearby. This guy is smoking weed. If I say something to him, I'm the bad guy. They want to fight me, you know? And um, I'm a cop myself, I'm a detective. So when I was a cop on patrol, I would just lock them up. But now you can't, you get in trouble. But at least that's per perception anyway. So I guess you could write them a summons for smoking marijuana in the park. But if they don't give you the ID, then you gotta let them go. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not even worth it, I guess. So I guess the cops got their hands tied, you know, but um, anyway, I just want to say that, you know, I didn't really prepare anything, but I just want to give support to the other two people on my block that spoke. Uh, I okay. appreciate it. Thank I, you. I, would have, I would suggest you also put it briefly in writing and email it to the board office. Okay. All right. Thank you. There's power in numbers, as they say. Thank you. Thank you. Christine? Christine? Christine, are you with us? Christine, you should be able to speak now. Unmute. Yeah, you're unmuted already. Okay, go ahead. I don't see her up here anymore. Um, Cormac? Colina Cormac. Hi, hi guys, Cormac, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just want to re uh, reiterate what some of my neighbors uh, uh, said. Uh, um, Marie, I do know what we need to do in terms of follow-up email, but um, I've been a longtime resident on 43rd Street, and being that I've been on this Zoom here for two and a half hours, I just want to give you my 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 ten cents on of course. What's, hap what's happening with Vaughan College. Uh, um, I would classify it as the last twelve months just significant deterioration. Uh, um, we're not talking about incidents; we're just talking about sustained patterns of behavior. Um, two predominant issues: one, Twentieth Avenue, which has become a consistent and ongoing speedway and raceway. Um, historically, it would have been later in the evening and more at the weekends, but now it's happening pretty much every night of the week um, and quite often during the day. 
not with all of the students at Vaughan College, but certainly a good amount of them. So we have constant speeding, we have quality of noise with muffler noise. Um, we need to have some conversations with Vaughan College. Uh, my neighbours and I have spoken to them both at this facility and at their head office. There needs to be some official intervention. We need to have speed cameras. We need to have noise cameras. We need to have action. Um, and the other main issue I would say is the parking of the students in the neighborhood who predominantly park on 43rd Street where I live and 45th Street. We know as residents that we own our houses. We don't necessarily own the streets, but we have all of the students in the college parking on two residential streets. They hang out in their cars between classes. They're smoking and drinking later in the day. They're not smoking cigarettes. I don't, I'm not concerned about people smoking marijuana as much as I am the behavior that happens after that. They leave all of their garbage outside of their cars before they go home, discard with COVID masks, broken glasses. Um, so for the last six or seven months and the last 10 months, it's just spiraled to consistent, completely unacceptable. Vaughan College need to be held accountable. It's their student body. Uh, um, I would prefer that that facility actually be closed down and Vaughan College could take them back into their main campus. Um, there need to be speed cameras. There needs to be police action and involvement in terms of what we have done. Uh, um, we've spoken in person to the facility down in 20th Avenue. We've spoken to their head office. We have called the police multiple times. One of the neighbors that just spoke uh, earlier has multiple, multiple videos, evidence, license plates, people, characters. Uh, um, it's at a point where this is becoming critical and a crisis and we need official intervention from you guys and we need help. So thank you for hearing me. Thank you for taking the time to come to us tonight. And again, I suggest you also call the district office to document this. It'll be documented here, but if you could put it in writing by email, there is power in numbers. Thank you. Anyone else? Dan Alaboda, you have your hand up, or is that from before? Dan? Okay, no, Dan. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? That was, that was from before. That was from before, okay, thank you. I, I got okay. one thing I'd like to say, Marie, is that possible? This is Richard? Yes, Richard. Yes, on, on the 24th, uh, for an unusual event, we're sponsoring a cleanup in Hallett's Cove in the water itself. We have scuba divers coming and uh, it's gonna be starting at 11 o'clock on going to maybe uh, in the water, maybe depending on the tide between one and 1.30. And uh, the, um, we're working with, uh, hosted by Socrates and is also a diving club that's working with us. Um, and a special thanks to Michael Delacus, who's an attorney locally, but he's also a teacher of scuba diving. So this should be an interesting event uh, to see what the uh, seafloor of Hallett's Cove will, uh, will bring us. So I hope that everybody joins us. And also tomorrow night, we will be hosting also a debate of the District 22 Council Candidates, uh, Old Astoria right. Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. Oh, thank you so much, Ron. Second. January. See you next Second. month. See you next month, all. Thank you for being here. See you next month. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Bye. Just leaving my community board meeting. <laughs> Hold on. Good night, everyone. Take care, everyone. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night, everyone.